Hello everybody, I will come back to part 4 in our discussion of object-oriented programming. In this lecture, inshallah, we are going to continue talking about object-oriented programming concepts. Specifically, we will focus on inheritance and polymorphism. Inheritance is basically a way to form new classes using classes that have already been defined. And one of its important benefits is the ability to reuse code that you have already worked on which in turn will reduce the complexity of a program. For example, we can create a subclass called CS120Student. For example, this will be our child class from the original class student, the parent class. So the new formed class CS120Student can use the student class in order to inherit some of its methods or attributes, which means that there are a lot of attributes and methods of my student class that are useful to the CS120 student class. Don't forget, a CS120 student class is a student at the end of the day. When defining a subclass, we put the name of the parent in parentheses after the subclass's name on the first line of the definition. You can see in the slide, we are writing the keyword class as usual. Then the name of my class, which is in this case CS120 student. Then between parentheses, we put the parent class name, which is a student. Of course, class student must be predefined before writing the subclass CS120 student in this case. In Python, multiple inheritance are supported, unlike Java, for example, which means a single derived class may inherit from two or more parent classes. For example, the class teacher can inherit from the class person and the class employee. You can see in this slide an implementation of a single inheritance. We have the original class student with attributes, full name and age, and a method called getAge, which are useful for a CS120 student class as well. So instead of redefining them in, in CS120 student class, we will make CS120 student class inherits from the super class student. So the way to do this is by passing the student class as an argument when defining the CS120 student class. So CS120 student in this case will be known as a derived class. Because we are deriving the features from the basic class student, we also say CS120 student class is a subclass from the super class student. The constructor of the subclass, the init method, contains a call to the parents in it. And we pass to it the values of the two inherited attributes, full name and age. In this example, we are adding also a new attribute to the subclass, which is section number. When creating a subclass, it's possible to redefine a method of the parent class so that it does something different. When doing this, we have two options. The first one, if we just type a new definition for this method's name, we have to use the exact same name of the superclass. By doing this, the parent class will be overridden and won't be executed. In the second case, if we want the old method to be executed with some minor changes, then we must explicitly call the parent's version of the method inside the child class method, as you can see here. Notice, in this case, we pass the self keyword as parameter. And this is done only when calling a method of ancestor. Don't forget what we said in the old video. We, we pass the self as a parameter only in method definition, not in method call. Just like redefining any other method, it's very common that we want to execute the parents init method in addition to the new commands. The init method of the subclass is usually written according to the following format, parent class dot init and we pass to it the inherited the values of the inherited attributes. So by calling the parents init method inside the child's init method, we keep the inheritance of all the attributes in the parents class. 
you can see in this example just a simple reminder of the old example we gave you in the previous slides let's pass to another concept in object-oriented programming which is polymorphism polymorphism is an important feature of class definition in Python that is utilized when you have commonly named methods across classes or subclasses this allows to overload standard operators so that they have appropriate behaviors based on their context. For example, here the subclass Paro and Ostrich have the same method flight, which is also a method for the parent class. This method is overloaded in the subclasses to display the appropriate message for each type of bird. So, you can see here we are defining three different objects, object bird of type bird, Obj SPR of type Sparrow and Obj OST of type Ostrich. For the first one, the message that would be displayed is most of the birds can fly but some cannot because this is a bird. Then for the second object, the message that would be displayed is sparrows can fly. Then for the third one, since it's of type ostrich, the message would be ostriches cannot fly. Another example here, we have a class person and subclass employee, which override the method named as employee. This method gives different output for every class, depending on its context. So we say here that the classes person and employee are polymorphic. Python itself have methods that are polymorphic. Example, the lem function can be used with multiple objects and all return the correct output based on the input parameter. Now let's return back to the example in this slide. We are defining two, two objects. The first one of type person and we are giving it the name geek1. Then we are printing the employee name, sorry, the person name, and if he is an employee or not so geek one will be printed and false of course because this is of type person not employee however for the second object we are giving it the name geek 2 and also we are printing the name of this object plus if he is an employee or not so geek 2 will be printed plus true because this is of type employee so let's pass to a real world example of inheritance let us assume that we work for a vehicle parts manufacturer that needs to update its online inventory system we are asked to program two similar but separate forms for website the first processes information about cars the second does the same but for trucks for cars we will need to record the following information color engine size transmission type and number of doors however for tracks we'll need them we'll need the following information color engine size transmission type cap size and towing capacity in this example we need a parent class named vehicle with the common attributes that are color engine size and the transmission type we'll create also two other subclasses car and truck which inherit the parent class so we don't need to redefine the attributes color engine size and the transmission type we just need to add the attributes number of doors for the car subclass and cup size towing capacity for the truck cup class Suppose that we have the following scenario. We suddenly need to add a pass form that records the following information. Color, engine size, transmission type, and number of passengers. So, in procedural programming, we'll need to recreate the entire form, repeating the code for color, engine size, and transmission type. However, in object oriented programming we simply extend the vehicle class with a bus class and we'll add one attribute which is number of passengers and the methods related to it you are not convinced yet about the benefit of object-oriented programming 
So let's take another scenario. Instead of storing color in a database, for some reason, a client wants the color emailed to him. To solve this problem in procedural programming, we have to change three different forms. Cars, trucks, and buses to email the color to the client rather than storing it in the database. However, in object-oriented programming, we just simply change the color method in the vehicle class, the parent class, don't forget. And because the car, truck, and bus classes all inherit from this class, they will be automatically updated. Yet another scenario. Suppose we want to move from a generic car to specific ones, for example, Nissan and Mazda. In procedural programming, we have to create a new form for each brand, repeating all of the code specific to each brand. However, in object-oriented programming, things are simpler. We just extend the car class with a Nissan class and a Mazda class. And then we add the methods for each set of unique information for that car make. I hope after those three scenarios, you are convinced that object-oriented programming is very useful and it will make your life easier. Let's practice an exercise. The question says, derive a class contact from the two base classes, person and address, then use their methods to print out the contact information. Hold on. Don't move to the next slide. Try to do it yourself, please. So here we are. We start by creating three classes, address, person, and contact. The last one, contact, will inherit all the attributes and methods of the first two classes, address and person. We add as well a new class called notebook in order to save all the contact lists. To do this, we created an empty dictionary named people as a global attribute, and we define two methods inside the notebook class. The first one is add. Each element in the people dictionary is a contact object. The second method is show with a parameter name. So it will search for a given name in the dictionary. If it finds it, it will call the contact show method to print all the contact details. So. Let's pass now to special built-in methods and attributes in Python. Classes contain many methods and attributes that are always included. Those has two categories. Either they define automatic functionality triggered by special operators or usage of that class, or built-in attributes that define information which must be included for all the classes. All built all built-in members have double underscore around their names, for example, init and doc are good examples of built-in members. Example of a special method is the str, which specifies how to turn an instance of the class into a string. Now printf, assuming f is an object, will call automatically the str of this class to produce a string of that object. However, if you did not override str in your class, it will be printing the address of the object, which is not what you want, I believe. Here an example of using str. We have a class user and inside it, we have the special method str. We create an instance from this class user1 with arguments Barack and Obama. Now when we print user1, it will call automatically str method and it will be displaying the following as output as you can see here. Here are other special methods. The init, the constructor, you are already familiar with it. We talked about it in the last video. Now what about greater than, le, less than or equal, ge, greater than or equal, equal and not equal. Those will redefine the operators that we are familiar with greater than, less than or equal, greater than or equal. Those operat operators, generally we use them with numbers, aren't we? However, we can use them with objects. Now, let's assume I wanna compare two students using the age attribute. So, in this case, I can redefine one of those operators. So, when I say student one, less than student two, I mean, is the age of student 1 less than the age of student 2? 
then this will give me true. So in this case, I could define one of those operators, less than or equal, greater than or equal. You could redefine len as well in your class and copy in order to create a proper copy of your object. In this example, we are creating class called user. This class has two attributes, first name and last name. Now we are creating two objects, user1 and user2. Now you can see user1, we are giving it Barack for first name, Obama for the last name. The same for user2. However, when we print user1 equal equal to user2, we are trying to compare the two objects, it will, pre it will print false. Surprisingly, even though they have the same content, because in this case, the program is comparing addresses of user1 and user2. He is not comparing the content. How to overcome this problem? By adding the function equal. In this case, we are overriding the operator double equal for comparison. In order to compare two objects, we, we will compare the first name with the first name and the last name of the first object with the last name of the second object. So this is a proper comparison. Now you can see when we print user1 equal equals to user2, it will print it true because both of them have Barack as first name and Obama as the last name. That is the proper comparison we are looking for. Let's talk a little about special data items. Those attributes exist for all classes. Doc, documentation, variable for documentation string for, for a given class. Class, variable which gives you a reference to the class from any instance of it. Moodle, variable which gives a reference to the Moodle in which a particular class is defined. Directory, it returns a list of all methods and attributes defined for an object X. This is a method, not a, dat a data item. Now let's take an example of special data items. Let's revisit the class user that we have created before. Now, we are trying to create an object called user1. We are giving it the first name as Barack, the last name as Obama. Now, what we are trying to print now? We are trying to print user1.class. Now, when we print this, we'll get main.user. User is the name of my class, as you can see here. And when we print user1.doc, it will print the documentation. The documentation in our case is the comment at the beginning of the program. That's all for today. Thank you for your listening. Stay safe.